First of all, we did the predictions for different surveys and we got pretty consistent numbers. Uh, we will continue what was written here, which is the number of lenses in the uh, VLA class observations. Uh, for your entertainment, I've also, yesterday we were showing, we were looking at these lenses from the Subaru Hyperim Supreme Cam uh, survey. Uh, on Google Drive, you can now see a small um, tutorial or, or a teaching set where you can uh, look at objects that are both ident identified as lenses and those who were not lenses. And then we have, I believe, almost 90 images. Half of them are lenses, half of them are not lenses. In your own time, feel free to go through the database. And um, there is a table where you can register your identifications. I'll reveal the results um, sometime next week. Um, so this is not part of the tutorials, it's just for you to have a feeling what type of data are we dealing with. Um, are we done with this? Sound fine. Okay, so I might start slowly. At the beginning, I'd like to introduce a new face here. This is uh, MJ Vakili. He's also a postdoc in Leiden. He'll be leading the machine learning course next, uh, next week. So all the things I was saying yesterday about uh, briefly touching the machine learning and lens finding, here, here's an expert. I, I was trash talking machine learning. <laughs> yeah. Okay, my apologies. There was a hiccup with the monitor set up. Um, so let me restart again. So what are we the final on the final day? I'll try to leverage what we have covered the, over the past uh, four days, which is that we'll use the strong gravitational lensing theory and the lens modeling approach and the results of the lens finding and um, sky surveys to tackle to use. Uh, gravitational lensing to tackle cosmological questions. And in no particular order, I selected the two key applications of gravitational lensing in the cosmological context, which is probing the nature of the dark matter and measuring the Hubble constant. And as has been promised on the first day, we are trying to understand this system RxJ1131. Um, in the first two days, we derived the positions of the lens images and uh, we understood why we have four quasar images over here is because the lens is elliptical and we know roughly where the source is located with respect to the caustics from our exercises. On day three we understood the extended Einstein ring and saw the pixelated reconstructions of the stellar emission. There are two more topics we haven't covered. One is the topic of the substructure which, which is this tiny galaxy close to the massive elliptical that's doing the lensing that needs to be included in the lens model and has some impact on, um, on our observations but, on, but also on our understanding on dark matter. And the fact that these four images are not, th th their brightness is not constant in time but varies and varies in different ways. So just to give you a brief shot, we'll talk about Hubble constant and the time delay cosmology. We'll say how quasar microlensing is messing things up. I'll, I'll briefly talk about different dark metal models and how we are trying to distinguish between them. I'll talk about machos, the massive uh, compact halo objects, which were a big thing in the 90s and early 2000s and what we learned from uh, them. Then I'll talk about current models of dark matter and particularly the importance of dark matter substructure to understanding uh, the properties of dark matter. And then I'll talk how we can me measure this with lensing using flux ratio anomaly and perturbations to Einstein arcs. So these are the two questions in cosmology. Okay, this is falling off the screen. The expansion of the universe, which is largely de determined by the dark uh, energy, but can be measured for the uh, Hubble constant. And the fact that we, the baryonic matter, you can't see the pie chart here, makes only 5% of the total energy density in the universe, with another about 27% in dark matter that we know very little about. And I will start talking about the, um, the Hubble constant first. So in 1964, 
before the first gra strong gravitational lens was discovered, a Norwegian astronomer, Sjö Revsdal, had this idea uh, that if you have multiple, if you would have strong lens, which lens is a variable source and makes multiple images, the time, if there is a change in the source, the time it takes for the signal to arrive to different images will differ and it will depend on the Hubble constant. Um, so the idea is, um, uh, is this. So we have the lensing equation that we saw in the days one and two. It was all in angles, if you remember correctly. Uh, it was uh, beta theta. Beta is a function of theta, the source position. Equals your observed image position minus uh, the gradient of uh, the lensing potential. These are all angles. There are no physical distances coming in the plane, in the place. Uh, so we remove the, dis the dependence on the distance between the observer and the lens, and the lens on the, and the source. But these distances are really related to the Hubble constant. If you had a small if you had a small Hubble constant, uh, these distances would get very large, but the angles here are preserved. And uh, if the Hubble constant is large, the physical distance here gets smaller. This is again, the angle is preserved. And also the size of your lens scales accordingly. So this is something we can't get from the image positions only. Uh, so we can't, image positions only don't depend strictly on these distances, but the time delay does. So this is, a, again, a, a different version of this figure, but now a bit f fancier. And if you have two different paths going through the lens um, with different uh, time delay, for a large Hubble constant, small universe will get small, short time, time delay. For if the distances are very large, the time delay will scale proportionally. So if we can measure the difference between the signal arrival to, the, to two different quasar images, we can try after some mass to infer age naught from this. And uh, this brings us back to the time delay surface we encountered on day two and then again in the exercises which is that the path, uh, the, the time it takes for a signal to arrive from the source to the observer is just proportional to the geometrical path. What is the distance between the source and the lens and the observer plus the vertical offset? And the gravitational time delay, which comes from the potential of the lens. Um, and as we saw that images are formed in the critical points of this equation, so you basically have to solve the gradient of this term needs to be equal to zero. Uh, short movie as a reminder, if this works. Uh, so consider an observer here. Here is a source over here, and if there is no lensing perturbation, all the um, rays travel straight towards us, and the time delay between two rays is very is negligible. If you put a massive lens over here, uh, the rays uh, coming from this side, from one image. This will replay in a second. So if you consider this family of rays, they hit us before these orange rays do, although they come from the same part of the source. They just take different, uh, different geometrical and gravitational paths. So back to our Mexican hat approximation. Um, so this is a time delay surface for a singular isothermal sphere. Again, combination of a parabola, a paraboloid uh, due to the a geometrical time delay, and this blip over here due to the a gravitational time delay. And we saw that depending on the image position, on the source position, we either get a ring and a central image, or three images, a minimum, maximum, and a subtle point or only a single image if the source is far away from the lens. 
Uh, one thing I omitted from the consideration so far um, was the issue of color. And um, you might go to the Kahoot. Um, let me bring it up. Yeah. So here is our Kahoot. And the question is, if you consider your lens in the sky, here you have the source, here you have the observer, and you take, you take uh, two different colors. So one ray goes here, comes back, and now we consider a um, ray from a different part of the spectrum, but traveling around the same path or almost the same path, will they actually take the same path or will they do something different depending on their wavelength? So that is a question for you. I'll start now. Uh, op think of it this way, in optical lenses, or in any optical elements, if you have a white light coming in, due to different refractive index, you will get this different paths for rays of different color. Is the same thing going to happen in gravitational lensing or not? Cool. Thank you. Um, so um, I'll simplify it down to this equation which tells you how the images are formed. Uh, so assuming all, all, all your rays of different color come from the same location of the source, the beta here will be the same. And in the deflection angle that comes from the um, lensing potential phi, there is no, never any dependence on wavelength. So this, this, makes, this makes gravitational lensing very different um, from, uh, uh, from normal optical elements. In normal optical elements, what happens is the refractive index, the effective refractive index is different for different colors. Uh, here, all the rays, whether they are red, green, blue, radio, X-rays, from the same part of the source, we'll see the same equation over here. So they have to be, to, so they have to cross the same part of the lens and come back to us. There are, of course, higher order effects. There could be some obscuration here, especially in the blue light. Um, but in principle, lensing is completely achromatic. Um, so I'll go now to, the, to our time delay surface. Uh, so now what I'm plotting is just this term for a singular isothermal um, sphere uh, to start with. So if you have a single isothermal sphere, what we get if you look from the top, the solid contours are positive on the time delay surface. The dashed contours are negative. So what we are looking at is basically our Mexican hat from the top. And I just highlighted here is the position of the maximum, of the local maximum. Here is the position of the local and also global minimum. Um, when we put in some ellipticity and offset the source a bit from the center, as we saw before, we have suddenly uh, four uh, images and the central images appear, central image appearing. So there will be a settle point over here, a settle point over here, there will be a minimum here, minimum here, and a maximum here. And this is a part of our derivation from, I believe, day three when you were asked to find extrema of a function. And if you offset the source even more, this configuration shifts a bit so you can see the, uh, the, uh, the distance between, the angle between these uh, images gets smaller. Oops. And uh, also the distance between these two settle points gets larger. The central, um, the central image doesn't move very much. Um, so this is basically a time delay, surface, uh, time delay function for a lens such as RxJ1131. And before we move any further, we will go to Kahoot again. 
Um, so think about the function I was just showing. I think it will, I'll just uh, briefly go back to the slide. Um, this is annoying. So we have a settle point over here, uh, minimum over here, minimum over here, maximum here, settle point over here. And so my question is going to be, if you take the four lens images of RxJ11031, I label them A, B, C, and D, and there is some change in the source, in what order will the signal arrive to these, three, these four images? I can briefly flick the, back to the slides. Okay, so the correct answer is B, C, A, D, and I'll just try to go through this uh, briefly. So consider this figure, and I'll now draw the lensing configuration of RxJ1131. So we would have an image A on top, then there is an image B over here, image C over here. There is a central image, which we don't see, as we um, l heard before. We have only found a s one central image in any of the lensed quasars, and here is the image D. So I guess if you sketch it uh, this way, you might start seeing um, what is happening here. So B corresponds to the minimum on the left. So does C. Uh, if there, there might be tiny differences uh, between the depths of these two minima, but they are usually very minute. A is a settle point. And D is also a settle point. So for the light to arrive to an image first means it goes, means you want to minimize the time delay for this image. So basically these two minima, if you would take a nice single isothermal sphere uh, with an offset source, so that would look something like this. Again, central image we don't care about. Here is a minimum here, and here is the time it takes for the ray to arrive to the uh, uh, to the image plane. So if the rays start, the ones that go up here will arrive before the ones that go to the settle points. So in this configuration, the B and the C image have the minimum time delay, and they will lighten up first. And then it gets tricky, because we have two settle points. Um, so then it gets a bit more hand wavy. But basically, what you can consider here is look at the, how deep the contours are. So here, this settle point is very close to the maximum. Um, they would be really somewhere here. Uh, whereas this settle point is much deeper in the time delay surface, and it's basically you have a minimum here, minimum here, maximum is quite offset from it. So this point will have slightly shorter time delay uh, than this settle point. Questions at this point? Because this was... Uh, The point is the light will first arrive at the, minima, at the minima of the function. These two are actually the global minima of the function. And uh, then there are, you have two settle points. And which of the two settle points brightens up first is a bit more, uh, that gets a bit more hand wavy. But basically, uh, what I did here is because when you count the contours, this one is deeper in the potential. It's also more offset from the maximum. We would expect this to brighten up before. Um, the settle point, the other settle point. Um, so this is actually what is observed. And uh, I would just like to mention that original Revsdal paper from 1964 talked about lens supernovas. Because supernovas are bright, they, they are, you can easily detect them, but they are actually pretty rare. But what is not rare are lensed quasars. Indeed, we have seen before how we have found large numbers of lensed quasars in different surveys. 
And some of the quasars are highly variable in optical wavelengths. Uh, so there are massive monitoring campaigns, such as Cosmograil uh, and Holical program, which are trying to measure a few select lens quasars, which, are, which have nice time delay, uh, which are ni have nice image separations, well understood lens models, and uh, good measures of time delay to, to try to measure age nodes to very high precision. And um, how does this look like for RxJ1131? Uh, so you use many years of optical monitoring. This stretches from 2004 to 2013, which is the, when the paper is from. It's still ongoing. We have six more years of data. And basically, each single point over here corresponds to sorry, single observation for each of the different images. Uh, there are multiple telescopes used for this to make sure that you know the if there is a bad weather in one location, maybe other location uh, will be better. Uh, you see also some improvement in, um, in uh, instrumental errors, etc. cetera. And um, I think what you see, where you see the time delay nicely is, for example, this part. So we see that the A, B, and C images start brightening up at almost the same time. So these are the... Uh, B and C are these two curves. These are the minima. A is the settle point. You can't really see the difference. I'll zoom in on the next slide. And then D is brightening up much later in time. And so this is very clear demonstration that the light really takes different, different time to go through these three points and the, the settle point over here. Uh, so this is a complex curve with loads of data points, uh, but very nice variation. You can also see the dip over here, where A, B, and C start dipping um, well before um, 4D does. And you can cross-correlate these curves, take care of the systematics, and try to look at the differences in arrival times between different images. Um, so here, what it should do, is, what I'm plotting is Differences in arrival time in days between image A and image B. Positive means that the image B or the second image, the signal arrives first. And negative means that A would, be, would have the first arrival. And we, we, when we compare A to B, you see that most of the measurements, depending on which technique you use, are offset to the positive side. So indeed, B. The, the signal at B is arriving before the signal in A by somewhere between a few hours and two days. The same holds for difference between A and C. So again, positive means uh, the signal arrives to C first, and we see this is more consistent with zero or maybe a small positive, um, positive number. The difference between B and C is all over the place because there are too minima and uh, it doesn't make much of a difference. And now you can see the difference between A and D, B and D, D and C and D. And what you should take from here, these numbers are very negative. So that means that images A, B and C, the signal arrives to them very be well before the image uh, D. And this is exactly what we saw here when the light curve is ramping up and then going down. Um, this campaign is still ongoing. So Cosmograil uh, is now in its 15th year. Uh, it's targeting not only RxJ1131, but a sample of 20 quasars. They're slowly adding more. Um, they're using... Uh, what is nice about this type of observation is you don't need large telescopes to do this. You don't need high resolution because the quasar separation, the uh, separation of quasar images is on the order of a few arc seconds. Um, if you select your targets well, and you can involve this even from one or two meter telescope. So this campaign is actually uh, helping a lot of small observatories in Europe and uh, uh, Russia and Chile now, um, sorry, Kazakhstan, um, to keep on going. Uh, they very recently varied even more time in Chile to observe some quasars in even better quality. And also having multiple locations around the globe means if there is a bad veteran in some sites, there might be good veteran at, uh, at some other ones. 
And here is the typical data quality from these telescopes. And so this is uh, what the HST sees in RxJ1131, the three bright images, the D image, lensing galaxy, and a small satellite over here. This is what you get from uh, Euler telescope, which is, I think, 1.2 meters. So you see the massive difference here. You have the effect of the atmospheric seeing. But because you know where your images are located, you don't know their fluxes, but their positions stay the same. And you can use the, and if you know your PSF well enough, you can deconvolve this and recover the free, the brightness of the free lensed images and the D image over here. And so this is the quality of the data they are dealing with with many different telescopes. And um, then you need to think carefully how you uh, extract time delays from these curves. Um, uh, so there's a number of different, uh, more, more and more sophisticated techniques, but basically this is uh, time delays for, um, th these are the light curves for another quasar. Um, and then when you do this, what you get is not only the time delay, but also it tells you how does your background quasar vary intrinsically. So this is basically you monitor the changes in the brightness of a quasar at high redshift with uh, you know, extremely high resolution. And if you combine this with, uh, um, with high precision lens models, because you need high precision lens models to uh, derive the distances, you can constrain Hubble constant to extremely high precision. So this is from a paper uh, from 2016, where from a single lens, from a single quasar from cosmogram monitoring, which had a really good lens model, they were, they were, a, they were able to constrain Hubble constant to within 3.84%. Um, uh, which is extremely high precision considering this was done from a single lens. Uh, this is now getting better. Uh, so now uh, Cosmograil has uh, been focusing and, uh, on these um, six quasars that you saw in our exercise on day three. Uh, they're using Hubble Space Telescopes and high resolution adaptive optics imaging from the CAC telescope in Hawaii to get very precise lens models for these uh, galaxies. And when you combine them together, uh, your precisions on age not increase to around 2.5%. So what you see here is from a paper from this year, uh, the probability, uh, this, the posteriors for age not uh, for all the six quasars. So some of them have very wide constraints, some of them have very, uh, uh, have rather good constraints, and this is the joint uh, probability function. And again, Cosmogra is monitoring about 20 quasars. This is going to go down in precision, uh, this is going to go up in precision very fast over the next few years. So these are the six quasars. Um, the problem with Hubble constant, I'm not sure if you've been following news recently, is that the measurements from different, um, different ways of measuring Hubble constant are getting much more and more precise. And so for a long time when the error bars were large, it seemed like we have a single value for Hubble constant. Now we are having a problem. Uh, so there are a few, here is a plot of a few different ways how to measure uh, Hubble constant, assuming you have flat lambda CDM universe. Uh, so this is a measurement from, these are two measurements from very early universe. There is one from uh, Planck using cosmic microwave background perturbations. Uh, there is one from baryon acoustic oscillations. And these two go around 67.4 plus minus one um, value. Now in the late universe, so closer to the present day, we have measurements from um, variables, different types of variable stars. Um, and the variable stars, here is the first um, holy cow result. And uh, this is the joint constraint from these two uh, measurements. And like, 
they are hardly consistent within, th within three sigma. The error bar, that's, the, that's what you get when your error bars get too small, that you start seeing these effects. So people have been trying to push this forward using different techniques, and it doesn't go away. So here is the same plot now with many more uh, programs um, uh, mentioned. So here is again Planck and the uh, Baryon Acoustic Oscillation results, 67.4, both of them. Here are different measurements from nearby universe. So this is um, varying surface brightness fluctuations, mega masers, the old Hubble type uh, study of using variable stars such as CFEATS. Uh, this is using different type of uh, variable stars that I don't know much about, but the error bars are okay, quite significant. Here is the Holycom measurements, and this is a very recent measurement from earlier this year, which uses a different technique using tip of the rand, uh, red giant branch stars, which is the only measurement that kind of starts falling in between. But there is a big clustering of measurements here, clustering of measurements here. And even if you combine uh, these measurements, there is quite significant tension. So this is, again, early universe results, very close to each other. There is, again, uh, <laughs> different... Uh, measurements from nearby universe. Um, and when you combine the late universe um, measurements, so this is, if you combine all of them, uh, but without these stars, you get six sigma tension with the Planck and Baryon acoustic oscillation results. If you, and then depending on how you combine the data, the tension goes maybe down to four sigma. If you include uh, the tip of the rand, uh, giant branch stars, the, this result. So even with this result included, we have four sigma tension with the early universe result. What is going on uh, there is hard to say. Maybe we are seeing some new physics here, in especially in terms of dark energy. Maybe we don't necessarily understand the systematics of all these measurements. And maybe there is a way how to bring them together. It's, one thing that's maybe pointing towards an answer is that until early 2019, this result wasn't here. So it seemed that there is a strong discrepancy now. Maybe there is a way how to reconcile these results. Which brings me to the reading list uh, I sent you uh, on day one. I have, haven't really updated since. But as a part of the reading list is a recent report from a, a conference in California, which tackled exactly this issue. Uh, so this, is, um, this was a meeting of different uh, teams from different, of, from different projects that met at one point in the Kavli Institute in California. And uh, I re highly recommend this article. It's popular science, but it also goes into lots of details. Involves interviews with all the main uh, people from different programs. And provides a pretty good discussion of how this controversy might develop further. Um, that's where I would leave the time delay part. Um, again, high precision measurements, lensing is very, co very uh, competitive, but we are seeing some discrepancies with other measurements. And um, now I will move to uh, an issue we have with time delays. And that is that so far we are assuming when we are doing lens modeling, the galaxies are reasonably smooth. But as we saw before, they are quite complex. They might have substructure, they might have disk, dark matter substructures, pile arms. There's a supermassive black hole that gets rid of our central images. There is some dust that uh, provides some obscuration. And there is a lot of stars in the lensing galaxies. So when you would go back to OK, I want to go back. If you take the, time, the light curves from our RxJ1131, they seem pretty synchronized. So we saw that image, images A, B, and C were brightening up together, and then D was trailing beyond them. So in the, when you plot things in this way, they look very nicely correlated. Now try taking the ratios. And you will see something like this. 
So this is RxG1131, uh, data provided to me by Dominic Sluice, but it's also publicly available. Uh, this is the same, I don't know, uh, 10 years of data. And this is the ratio, okay, for our axis, but this is the ratio of the brightness of the A image, the brightest image, and the B image, and the A image and the C image. And it fluctuates, and uh, if this would cooperate, uh, so A and versus B ratio changes, varies between 1 and 5 in this, sorry, no, uh, yes, it varies between roughly 1 and 5 during this epoch, and also A over C ratio varies between roughly 5 and 15. And so around this time, I think it was around 2010, for some reason the A over B and A over C ratios shot up and the easiest solution is that something happened to the A image, the brand, this image over here, and only to it. If you would put B over C ratio, it stays roughly constant with some ups and downs. But something strange happened to this one image that made it look much brighter for a couple months. And like by much brighter, I mean five, five times brighter compared to the B image. And this is not a unique result. This is the Einstein cross that we have also seen before. And this is a monitoring now in many different colors. So, you know, colors take the same path. And uh, if you take the ratio of uh, which uh, images is this? I forgot. I believe it's uh, these two. So if you take the ratio, uh, this is now in magnitudes, you see there is a big dip at some point and going up and the, big here, the dip here is like half a magnitude. It's pretty significant and it's in you know, basically all the colors, maybe with a slightly different strength. But also here something happened to one of the images that made it go, in this case, much fainter. So it's count time again. Uh, so Something in these lensed quasars can happen, to sing can happen to single images. And what do you think it is? What is causing not the fluxes, but the flux ratios vary in time? Is it because we actually don't have a good enough lens model? Or is it the variability of the background source? Is it something to do with the dust in the galaxy? Or is it something to do with maybe microlensing by stars? Just to strengthen what is involved here. So this is not variation of the brightness of individual images. It's the ratios that vary for some strange reason. Ooh. That is, that is split very evenly. So let me walk you through the, through the options here on the table. Uh, let's start with the variability of the background source. It is true that the background sources in these images, because they have time delay measurements, are, and there are significant uh, variations. But that doesn't, that would explain, that ex so if you would take, let's say I have two images. Um, A does something like this, and then I have a much delayed image D that uh, does the same thing, uh, but with a delay. Uh, what do you? And this is uh, this is my zero. What do you, you should expect here? Um, if you would take the ratio of these two curves, there is just some time delay between them, and the ratio of A over B should stay constant. These are just two delayed functions. Am I saying it right? I'm not. Good point. I'm most likely not. Okay. That's the, that's the part uh, I... I forgot. So yes, that would cause the cause the these curves to vary. So what I 
forgot to say is uh, if you correct for the time delay, which we can measure by t taking the total, no, 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 no. In principle, if you know your lens model and the time delay, the ratio between two images, if, if they are following the same curve, should stay the same. Uh, the dust is interesting proposition, uh, but it's very unlikely. Um, so this would mean that, let's say, dust starts drifting across one of your images. That can happen, uh, but the time scales for that would be very large. And crucially, what we see here is that if the dust was indeed a problem, there would be strong dependence on the color. In uh, blue, you would basically have one image comp disappear completely. Red colors wouldn't be that, mu that much affected. Lens model is the easiest thing to rule out. Um, because no matter how bad your lens model is, you, just, you are just, in principle, measuring the brightness of these images. And the lens model doesn't necessarily have to enter into them. And it's actually the microlensing by stars. And the issue, and the reason is if you, each of the stars in the lensing galaxy has its own tiny Einstein radius. And we, we saw this from uh, day two when we were talking about how we look for exoplanets uh, using microlensing surveys. So lensing by, microlensing by exoplanets is rare, but these, if you are looking at the galaxy far away from us, the number of stars along the line of sight is very, very large. And each of them makes a tiny Einstein radius of its own. And it wouldn't normally be a problem because, you know, if, you have an, if, if your source is a big galaxy and you lens it, for, and you, and you lens it it's going to be much larger than a single, radius, a single Einstein radius of a star. But what, we, what, our, what is our source is the inner part of, is the quasar. And qu the inner part of the quasar is tiny. Uh, so this is a diagram of a quasar. Here you have the jet. Oh, why is this? Okay. Uh, here we have a jet. Here we have the dusty torus, a black hole in the center, accretion disk around it. And when you go, when you zoom in, uh, forget about the wild part for a moment, the accretion disk itself is 0.001 or 0.002 parsecs. Then there is the, the larger accretion disk, which is uh, on the order of a few tens or hundreds of a parsec. And what I plotted over in uh, purple is an Einstein radius of a single star in a faraway galaxy. So you're the, the Einstein radius of a star that might drift in front of one of the images is comparable to the size of your source, and it makes it very likely that we will do the microlensing. This has this is a more complex subject because like, Microlensing by thousands of stars is uh, difficult to, um, to disentangle. But in a, there is now a, a big field trying to use this to measure the, really the sizes of the innermost parts of quasars. Because getting a resolution of 0.01 parsecs, even in nearby galaxies, is basically impossible. But if you can trace, let's say by emission lines, different parts of the inner region of the quasar, and see whether they are sensitive to microlensing or not. It can tell you something about their physical size. So moving away from the quasars and slowly finishing with time delays, Revsdal originally said, or, or the original prediction from 1964 was that we would observe lens supernova. And back then, actually, in the paper, the prediction was that we would find two, I think, one lens supernova every two years. With the 1960s technology, that never materialized, uh, that never happened. We had to wait 50 years um, for something like that to happen. So here is one of the, so here is a cluster of galaxies. There is some massive ellipticals over here, massive ellipticals over here, massive elliptical over here. And it lenses this spiral galaxy in a pretty unique way. 
There is one spiral galaxy image over here, one image over here, one, one image up here. So we have three images of this lensed galaxy, very distorted. And in the optical monitoring at some point, in uh, uh, late 2015, what was found was that suddenly in this image, four blobs of light appeared. That is a supernova. That's not a quasar. This is a supernova happening in a higher trip galaxy that happens to be lensed by, uh, uh, by this massive cluster. So here are the two other images of the galaxy in case it's, they are difficult to spot. And so, you know, we have one image over here. So the question is, when will the supernova appear in these two images? Because the signal has to arrive at some point. We have the full galaxy over here. It appeared over here four times. So if we had high enough candence monitoring, we were monitoring frequently enough, we would see these images going off one by one. We missed that. But uh, so the question is, when, do, when, does it, when, when would it appear in these two uh, images? And this is a massive headache for people who actually do modeling of galaxy clusters. Because now you have a real test of how good your models are. You have to model the mass of the, ga mass of the foreground uh, galaxies. It's a massive cluster. People claim they can do it all the time. We saw it with the Hubble frontier fields, where people do deep exposures of um, lensing clusters and try to look for higher shift galaxies. So now they have a cluster they can model. And they have actually lots of information from these three images. And the challenge they had was to predict when will the next image appear and where. The challenge is massive. So you have these three images. And you can't see it over here. But there's a lot of galaxies in this field. Uh, they are color coded blue, which, is, which are not the cluster members. And then there are the pink ones. Um, dozens of them all over the place, like everything over here, some stuff over here, some stuff over here, lots of stuff over here, that need to be included in your model with different level of precision. And then you need to predict when will the image appear and where. And um, so there are some early models. So this is a time delay surface um, let me see. from uh, two different uh, models. And uh, this is, might be hard to read, but here is where the, uh, let me see. Here is where the first images appeared. Here are the other two images of the lensed galaxy. And the contours are again negative here and positive here. So this is the image up here. It's at the time delay minimum in both of these two models. This one is, uh, actually around, uh, these are around the saddle point, and this is another saddle point. So we saw the, the supernova going up over here. That immediately tells you they missed it here. Because this image would have brightened up first. So what happened here, the supernova went off, we weren't looking at the galaxy, so we never saw it, and it died again. So we are left with a single prediction when will the image in this galaxy, uh, when will the supernova appear in this image, and where exactly. So if you zoom in, now you can see the structure again. Here, are the, here is where the supernova happened, appeared. Here is the saddle point. And these are the predictions of different models, um, which are falling over here. But what I uh, only plotted is the expected time delay um, between the original image and when will the, the new image appear. So this is the, for the image that was going to happen in the future. This is for the image that happened in the past. And you see like, in the past it might have happened 90, somewhere between 1994 and like days ago. Somewhere that this is hard to constrain, but you know, this is the part where you make predictions. When will the next image appear? So people had to place, the, put their models on the table make their, their predictions, place the bets. And then it appeared. A year later, in 2000, uh, at the end of 2015, 
Um, so here's the second image. Uh, this is in uh, January 2011, April 2015, December 2015, just before Christmas. There was sudden brightening over here. So now we know the position and the time when this thing appeared. And we can compare it to the models. So again, these are the predictions. How long will it take for the, uh, the second image to appear? And you see they range from late to from somewhere in generally in 2015, 2016 to end of 2016 to end of 2015 to mid 2016. This is where they appeared. So we have two models that predicted the, the image position, the image appearance pretty well. Well, three if you count this one. Uh, to show you the, okay, you can't necessarily see this. Um, to show you how precise were people with predicting the position as opposed to timing of the image, uh, here is where the image appear, and I will just draw some circles. So here is the best model by Claudio Grillo, uh, who predicted the position of the image the best, not the time delay. There are two other models by Diego and collaborators and uh, Mathilde Yozak, which uh, had the image position in their uh, prediction limit. As a byproduct of all this massive monitoring that was going on with this cluster while we were waiting for the next supernova to appear, something interesting happened. A stars in, in the background, in the cluster, you have the, uh, the critical line, which is uh, where the new highly magnified images might appear. And so what suddenly happened in, um, uh, in May 2016, a very weak thing became very bright, and it is right around this, cost, this critical line region. And when you take a spectrum of this thing, oh, is it, the next, is it another supernova? It's a single star. A single star in the source galaxy at redshift 1.5 was going through a region of very high magnification, roughly, I think, the order of 10,000. And so for, a, for a very brief moment, we were able to see it and I think even get some spectroscopy from it. So that's the most distant star we have detected so far. That's it for the time delays and uh, Hubble constant and uh, challenges for modelers and most distant stars. Now we'll move to the second challenge for cosmology, which is the nature of dark matter. This part of this uh, pie chart. And uh, what is dark matter? Well, we know it is there, most likely, but still don't know what it is. Um, for example, it could be a squirrel. Uh, this is a comic from XKCD. Basically, dark matter is everywhere. It doesn't evade much. There is roughly one squirrel of, um, of dark matter uh, spread across the Earth. Um, and uh, let me see. OK. And uh, one of the first ideas for dark matter originally was um, that it is just composed of, so we know that dark matter is something that has weight, but we can't see it. So maybe it's just stars or planets that don't really have that, give out that much radiation. So we don't see them in, in optical telescopes, but still we see the effect of the mass. Or it could be also primordial black holes. So how you can test this? This is an idea that came in the late 1980s. They don't give out any light. You could try to see whether they cause absorption of, star, of, star, of um, background stars. But planets are really tiny. So they don't have really that much of an absorption cross-section unless you really have the, uh, the full transit. But they still have considerable mass, so they, act as, so they can act as micro-lenses. And this is a plot we saw before, and I think you were also supposed to get it in one of the exercises. 
This is a microlensing curve when, you're, when a compact object moves in front of a compact source, and depending on the closest approach, you get either very high magnification or somewhat lower magnification. But the point is, although we can't resolve multiple images in a microlens, we still get the total brightening. And when I was talking on day two about looking for planets by microlensing, and we found a few of them very interesting ones, but very few, that's not why we were doing microlensing for decades. The motivation for these surveys I introduced back then, with all these uh, uh, massive uh, observing campaigns, was to actually look for machos. Was to look for microlensing by stars, by uh, low mass stars, by small black holes, maybe by, also by planets. And uh, so these are the two surveys that, uh, there are, that also got some exoplanets. But the one I will focus on now is the Eros and Eros 2 surveys. One thing about this area of science, calling your object machos and then naming your, your survey Eros is not good if you use safe search on. It's like, come on, guys. Uh, uh, so Eros started in 1990 just after the first idea that we can probe dark matter with microlensing arrows. 1990 means that they used very early CCDs and even photographic plates back then. Then it got expanded and lasted until 2003 on uh, now decommissioned one meter telescope in Chile. And what they did, they looked into, uh, they looked at the regions where we have very dense uh, star concentration, such as the galactic bulge and the local and the large and the small Magellanic clouds, because if you have a high density of sources, you increase your probability that something moves in front of one of them and causes a microlensing event. And this came up with a lot of, uh, uh, so these are uh, results from errors, a lot of microlensing curves, like they found a couple dozen. Here you see the nice peaks uh, as the source, as the lens moves in front of the of the background source, and you see these are massive, this amplification of the order of 25, 25, 5, uh, order of a few. But these are a few dozen detections and literally 15 years of observations. So what comes out of that is that machos don't really work. So these are the constraints on the mass of the macho candidates, so 100 solar masses is more like primordial black hole. 10 to the minus 3 solar masses is, is a planet. Everything below that is not going to make a, much of a microlensing signal. And this is the how much of the dark matter halo mass could machos make up. And this shaded region over here is the region excluded by the error survey. So the error survey is basically meant, Eros 2 survey, the result was that between something that weighs like a planet and primordial, primordial black hole, between, this can make up between a few percent and at most maybe 10 to 20 percent of all the dark matter we need in the, in the halo of our own galaxy. Matchons don't really work. This was, uh, this year there was a very nice nature paper where someone tried to redo this with a very different strategy. Uh, so what Eros and uh, MOA and um, uh, Oglo were doing was use low frequency observations, low resolutions, look at, at the Magellanic Clouds galactic center, take a very long time and hope there is a lot of, there is some microlensing events. The Nikura team from Japan had a very different idea. Go to a big telescope, which is a massive collecting area look at something that's super dense, but that you can start resolving, such as the Andromeda galaxy, which is, which is m much higher density of sources than the galactic bulge or LMC and SMC. Because you have large telescopes, you can do very short exposures and still have good signal to noise ratios. So instead of doing, visiting every field one, once or twice, uh, one, once in one or two days as done with the previous surveys, they were basically taking snapshots every two minutes and looking for microlensing events in a single night. And if macros was a viable model, they would have hundreds of events. They found one. And when you plot their constraints, so these are the original constraints from Eros and Macho, 
some big constraints from, uh, from Kepler, some constraints from CMB, and uh, some other models that have, uh, come from particle physics. In a single night, they, they excluded all this massive chunk of parameter space. Now it's parameterized in terms of black hole mass, but you get the, get the point. And so now they excluded even any sort of plants. This goes down to 10 to the minus 10 solar masses. This is an amazing result, in my opinion, done with a very clever observing strategy. So that's the end of metros, most likely. Exoplanet hunting, this is still going to be cool. Maybe looking for primordial black holes. Uh, I'm not sure if you saw the news from yesterday that, uh, that they found uh, 20 solar mass uh, black hole, which is uh, larger than what we would expect from any of the models. So this might be still valuable, but explaining dark matter, not really. So over the years, we converged to the fact that dark matter is a new type of a particle. And specifically, the, the preferred model now is the so-called cold dark matter model, which has been immensely successful at reproducing a lot of uh, observationals, but it still needs to be tested on small scales. Um, to explain again what is happening here, and uh, so the motivation for dark matter comes from the fact that rotational curves of many of galaxies rise up very quickly in the center, but then they stay, stay flat in a region well beyond all the stars and gas. And for this you need a spherical dark matter halo. And uh, as a small digress, this is actually how we also get the single isothermal profile. So the idea, so the flat rotational curves means that your uh, velocity as a function of radius is constant. But also when you realize the centrifugal force and a gravitational force, the velocity here at this point gives you an idea of how much mass is enclosed within the radius. When you solve this, you get that your mass enclosed is proportional to the radius you are measuring it, and that's exactly what we had from a single isothermal sphere. Of course, the, you can't extend it to radius going to infinity, but this is where our why single isothermal sphere actually does work as a viable um, model of galaxies. So the, there is the one challenge for the cold dark matter model has been the so-called missing satellites problem. And it is this. So we, you might be familiar with cosmological simulations when we take, um, when we run a lot of the dark matter particles, or we can also put baryons in, let them involve in a large volume loom for a very, very long time, and look and look at what we get. And if you take the halo of your typical of your massive galaxy, this is from the Aquarius simulation. This is dark matter only uh, plot, and as we all know, dark matter is purple because uh, that's what the simulators always use. So what you see here is like a massive galaxy in the center, that's this big concentration of dark matter. And loads of dark matter structure, small blobs floating around. And this is indeed an extremely robust prediction of a cold dark matter model, that on top of your main galaxy, you will have loads of sub uh, dark matter con concentrations. Some of them might be surely numerical artifacts, but this is an extremely robust prediction. If you do this for the Milky Way, which is actually what the Aquarius team did, you see that Milky Way should have tens of thousands of these, and hundreds of them will be massive enough to contain us ga enough gas and stars to form small satellite galaxies. Well, we have, so here is another snapshot from different simulation. Here is an old plot of how many satellites of Milky Way we know, very few. There is a discrepancy by an order of magnitude here, and sure, people are trying to use deeper observations and are trying to find uh, fainter and fainter satellites. But ultimately, this is where we still are. This is the, take this as a ma um, mass of a satellite. Uh, this is the number of satellites we have. This is the prediction from cold dark matter theory. These are the observations, and we are pretty sure we found all the massive satellites. Now it's about the, le the, least, the less massive ones, but discrepancy here is like, this is, we found, for example, 30 here, we expect 200. This is like a factor of 10 discrepancy, 
And yes, we found more since 1999. I mean, it's been 20 years, but it's not that great. The issue here is if you tweak your dark matter model slightly, and you move to, from cost to warm dark matter model, which is just slow, slightly tweaking the mass of your dark matter particle, you erase most of these subhalos. Then your dark matter is not allowed to concentrate so easily anymore, and you are left with only a few very massive subhalos. And these, these might actually match the number of, sa of satellites of Milky Way we observe. Um, so how you can how this translates into this uh, mass function? If you look at the subhalo mass and the number of subhalos, as you incre as you go from cold dark matter, which is this black curve, uh, you can put some modifications when you include hydrodynamical simulations because tidal stripping and supernova will modify your dark matter halo concentrations slightly, but not by much. You see it here. And then when you take the different warm, warm dark metal models, you can make this function bend over and flatten out for low mass subhalos. And the issue we have, the constraints of the satellite masses we have are somewhere around here. So what we would ideally like to do if we want to distinguish between these different models is to find subhalos with very low mass, count them, done. People are trying to do this uh, using different techniques around the Milky Way and also Andromeda. Uh, the problem is that even if we are successful around Milky Way and Andromeda, we will have one, maybe two galaxies, and this is far too low for any robust statistics. So what we would ideally like to do is to do this in a large number of, uh, of galaxies at different, ideally different redshifts, and just to Keep in mind for the, what, we, what is coming forward. The prediction from the cold dark matter model says that about 1.4% of the total dark matter mass is in subhalos. And the slope of this function is about minus 2. And again, if you can see, this is an effect when you vary your dark matter uh, model. So this is uh, something close to cold dark matter. This is very warm dark matter. And if you can see the changing number of white blobs around, you see the effect changing your dark matter model would have. Remember the par and this is cool. Because this will be very, because if you have, so these are how our galaxies look like. They've been talking that they have these smooth dark matter halo profiles all the time for the past four days. But in fact, there will be small subhalos in your lens. And they will have an effect on what you observe. Remember when I was saying earlier in this lecture how we have microlensing effect in uh, some of the lens quasars. Imagine now, imagine you don't have them. You on top of the stars moving across your images, you have a massive subhalo sitting over here. And so it will have some gravitational lensing effect on this particular image, but not the remaining ones. And from the lensing equation and from your smooth uh, lens model, you can pred you predict the positions of the images, which uh, don't depend super strongly on the details of your lens model. But the fluxes do. If you have some small lens on top of this image, it will magnify it or demagnify it significantly. And this perturbation is going to be constant in time. You know, these are still on the size of small galaxies, they don't move very fast. Um, so what you can do is to go through lensed quasars, calculate what kind of flux you expect for all these uh, images, monitor them for a long time, so you exclude microlensing, and see if you find some that have an image that doesn't have the flux you would expect. And this is seen, for example, here, uh, in B2045265 in radio wavelengths. So what you would expect here is the B image, the central image over here, to be the brightest one. But for some reason, it's not. So this is at VLA at 8.5 gigahertz. But they have the same issue at 15 gigahertz. And in near infrared wavelengths. Um, some, there, is, there is some issue with absorption. So ideally, you want to do this across a wide range of wavelengths. But this does seem pretty robust. 
And indeed, if you take very deep observations with adaptive, adaptive optics, you will find that there is a very faint satellite galaxy over here that actually modifies the magnification of all the images but has the biggest influence on the B image. So this is a nice demonstration by looking at lens quasars, we can try to find a substructure and quantify it. This is the highlighted one. And uh, this has become very powerful. So here is a result from 2014 from Anna Nirenberg in uh, California, but now she's improving this even more. So she's using not only imaging, so you should see a triple lens quasar HST image, but she's also using uh, integrated field units to also get spectra for each pixel in her image on the CAC adaptive optics. And for this quasar, um, there is some issue with the A image. And what she gets, she models uh, this uh, basically where you can put a substructure and of, and of what mass. And if you assume your substructure is in a single isothermal sphere, this is your one and two sigma contours of where your substructure could be. And for each position, she also calculates the, what, the what would be the mass of the substructure. Uh, what fell out of here, and you can't see it, is that uh, for, the one, for the, this one sigma region, the inferred mass of the substructure is 10 to the 7.5 solar masses. This is really good. But the problem with uh, these type of studies has been you need to know your lenses really well. And uh, what, has been, what has happened a few years ago is that, few pe that um, Genevieve Sue in uh, California, later in the Netherlands, went for some of these lenses where we had very strong flux ratio anomalies and took very deep high-resolution high observations of them in near-infrared. And she found that there are disks. And in some of these cases, such as this one, there is a, you should see, I think these are the free, these are the lens images, you see some nice Einstein arc. There is a problem with the flux ratio of them. And if you, you might be able to see it, that in her very deep observation, she found there is a disk going on straight into, straight through these images, which messes up your lens model. Just as a sanity check, we will do Kahoot. Uh, so think about these disks messing up your lens models. What kind of disks do you need to worry about? OK, you can't see anything here. Basically, what you should see here is a disk face on towards you. And this one is the disk that's edge on. I'll sketch the situation here. So the option on the left is the disk looks like this. So it's flattened towards you. The other one is your disk is like this. Which one of them is going to mess up your lens model more? OK, the answers are coming. Ooh, I have bad news for you here. Um, let me explain. First thing we did in terms of approximation, remember the exercise we did on day one when we had this sheet of mass extending all the way to infinity? And the, what it meant is basically that the rays going through it would continue straight. This is actually decently close to that. And also what you can think about is uh, your lensing equation over here. Your lensing potential is basically proportional to the integral of your gravitational potential over the line of sight. And what happens here, you pile a lot of mass along your line of side, side integral. So the correction you will need to do to your gravitational potential because of this disk, and then to your deflection angles, will be much more significant for this type 
than for this type. Because what happens here, if you look, look at it from the um, along the line of side direction, you'll have a sh small blip over here because the mass per line of sight is small. But here, you pile your mass across a much larger range. So the correction is going to be significant. And that is what you can see also in, the, in these issues. The disk over here is edge on. It's like this. In the previous case, you can't see it very well from uh, over there, but the disk is again edge on. So this is something we need to be very careful when we are doing, trying to use flux ratios to look for substructure. The good point is that now we learned that for, the, for us to do this correctly, we need to get very deep observations at high resolutions to understand the substructure of the, of the galaxy, whether there are any disks or nearby objects. And if yes, we just include them in our model. And we are back in the game. So this is how we get substructure from lensed quasars, but we also have Einstein arcs. And this is the last topic for today and for this course. Yes? Yeah, I, I don't understand very well. I, I understand the idea of the use that the gravitational plane yeah. and the distribution of matter in the other one that is H on will affect more and more. Yeah. But what about the radiation that the galaxy emits by itself? It's not a biggest problem in comparison to the gravitational level. That's a very good point, yes. Um, but that is um, again going to be so assume that the total number of stars into this component of this galaxy is the same so what will happen and also we will, we will very likely have some dust in the disk too so what is going to happen here you distribute your amount of stars and dust kind of uniformly across your entire lens what happens here is when you take your lens in your projected lens in galaxy you pile this extra light and dust preferentially into some very compact regions. So this might have additional effect that actually it might attenue, not only have gravitational effect, but add light to some of these images or actually put dust, loads of dust above one of them. That's a, that's a, so even accounting for this, the, the disks are uh, more, the edge, the edge on disks are more of a problem. You can try to get around this in some ways. You can go away from the optical wavelength. So uh, radio wavelengths or millimeter wavelengths don't care about the dust or starlight. Um, so then you can you really only care about the gravity effect. And on the other hand, uh, what we have in phase on, and we have also a lower radiation. Yeah. Uh, how can we distinguish that this radiation is not from the phase on and in effect from the from the uh, lens because excellent point um, excellent point uh, it's tough uh, but the so imagine I have a disk that has uh, some spiral arms here I'll put one KVAT on top of that uh, again let Strong lenses are preferentially elliptical galaxies, so they, their light and mass are dominated by the elliptical component, not necessarily the disk. But if you, if you would have a pure spiral as a lensing galaxy, so imagine I have two images of my source, one arc over here. I'll talk about arcs because lens quasars are easy to spot. And one arc over here. So now this is indeed going to be a problem saying, okay, what is from the foreground lens, what is from the background lens, what is from the background source. But you have two images of the same source. So what belongs to the source will be correlated between these two images. So you can basically try to separate, uh, I'll explain a few slides, but basically the component A should be over here, component B should have an image over here, component C should be, have an image over here. If there are some contribution from the foreground galaxy, like I might have a spiral arm going over here, I'll sit in, the, I'll sit in this image, but not in this image, because they are uncorrelated with what is happening in the foreground galaxy. Yes, this, this gets often very tricky, and uh, 
uh, because the image might have, images might have very different magnification, you have to be very careful with the model length. So, so with very precise instruments, we could then extract uh, a lot of detail of the inner structure of our products, for example. Uh, what I mean is, uh, we normally don't detect the distance between uh, stars or something like that, but if I, if I have the possibility to measure red chips and things mm -hmm. on top of that, could I, it's, it's, there, is there a high probability of that? Um, I think it's going to be. I think it's going to be very tricky because, um, let's say at beyond redshift one, your angle one arc second angular resolution corresponds to roughly eight kiloparsecs. So eight kiloparsecs, just to put into perspective, is the distance between the sun uh, and the center of the galaxy. So what we can do, for example, with um, Alma which is like a super highest resolution thing we can imagine, we can push this then to 0.01 arc second, which is about 80 parsecs. But ALMA is very bad at spotting stars. It's sensitive to dust. This might start changing with the 30-meter uh, telescopes, because they will push for the 10, uh, 10 uh, milli arc second resolution with adaptive optics. Um, but the typical distances between stars are, would be more on the order of a few parsecs. However, for strong lens systems, this will become likely possible. So just to finish, there was a few very good points uh, that also saved me some slides. So now imagine you have all this substructure floating around in the galaxy. Um, I'll reuse my sketch. And you have an Einstein arc. So I have my big galaxy, lots of small things floating around. There's an Einstein arc, arc coming over here. And if you have a nearby subhalo, and it will act as its own small gravitational lens and make a kink in your Einstein arc. And it is beautifully seen in this galaxy, where we have a big elliptical with few um, nearby galaxies, and one of their satellites falls on top of the Einstein ring and makes his own small Einstein rig on top of that. Um, so this is another way how we can use not lensed quasars, but Einstein arcs to look for substructure. And this is something that has been done a lot by my former PhD supervisor, Simona Vajetti, who combined pixelated lensing reconstruction codes with um, I'll, it's better explained here because we have more data. So on top of having a smooth lens and a pixelated source, she includes corrections to the lensing potential that would come from substructure and looks for perturbations that happens to, happen to only one arc, as we, as we were talking before. If, if there is a structure in the source, it will be shown in both images. But if there is some perturbation due to the lens structure, it will happen in one of these two images only. And so she found a 2 times 10 to the 8 solar massive substructure directed to 0.9 galaxy in 2012. She also, before that, reanalyzed this galaxy to make sure the technique works. And indeed, you find a substructure over here. I mean, we knew it was there, but it's good to know that it works. Then there's the substructure. The problem here is that you need to have still decently mass massive substructure. And you are only sensitive to things that are very close to the Einstein arc. So there, this has been applied to a lot of lenses, but it has not been necessarily super successful in getting detection. So Vegeti 2014 and last 11 of the slags lenses we talked about yesterday got one detection in 11 of them. And uh, my former colleague Elisa Loretton Dale analyzed 17 galaxies from Dahl sample, which is another uh, sample of galaxies, got zero detections in very high resolution data. This doesn't mean we are not successful. This is actually telling us something very important. Because, what do you, because that means we don't have massive enough substructure in a high enough density to get close to the arcs often enough. So what you can do, uh, do I have it on the next slide? I don't. So what you can do is to t make mock data. You take your Einstein arc, you put a subhalo in it some 
close to it somewhere and see whether you can detect it or not. And you can do it for different masses of subhalos and different positions in the Lansing galaxy. And so you know what is the maximum, what is the maximum, or what is the minimum mass of a, of a subhalo you could detect, let's say, this position, at this position, this position. So you have some sort of a sensitivity function. If you don't detect anything, it still gives you some very useful upper limits. And upper limits are good. And just to show you how this is going to work in practice once we build up large enough samples. So this is the mass, of, uh, mass fraction of substructure. Uh, this is the mass function slope simulation. Say this should be around 0.5%. And the slope should be around um, 2. If you have 10 lenses and we can get the mass detection limit to 1 times 10 to the 8, these are the constraints we will get. I mean, pretty bad constraints for low substructure mass because you don't have that many subhalos that can come close to your Einstein ring. If you have a lot of substructure, the number of subhalos that, that are massive enough and come close to your Einstein ring gets higher, and you should detect many more of them and be able to reconstruct this more precisely. But if, as you add up lenses, these contours shrink. So with 30 lenses, and remember between these two papers, the, they analyze 28. Um, you, if the true mass fraction was 2.5%, it would detect it very precisely. We don't see that many perturbations. Still, the, the constraints of the more realistic 0.5% mass in substructure would be much weaker. But if you can lower your detection limit, now we are around 10 to the 8 solar masses, you could nail this very precisely. What also helps to lower the, the detection limit is to go to high resolutions. So here are again the, the different predictions for, from the argumentary models. And here is a typical resolution which is proportional to the subhalo mass. Uh, so depending on your subhalo mass, it sends your Einstein radius of a subhalo. And so this is what we typically probe with the Hubble Space Telescope imaging. So these are really only the most massive subhalos, where the models don't differentiate too much. With CAC adaptive optics, we might get down here. With Emerlin and Alma in the radio and millimeter waves, we can get down to 10 to the 7 solar masses. And with the VLBI, uh, we can go down to 10 to the 6, where the difference between the predictions is like two orders of magnitude. Um, I just highlighted roughly where the current detections are. So somehow from Einstein Arcs, we are still, oh no, it should be over here. So from, um, from Hubble Space Telescope data and CAC data, we are somewhere around here. Uh, from flux ratios and analysis I was showing before, we are somewhere around 10 to the 7.5. And there was a recent detection, well, a few years ago, also in Alma, where they found an SDP81 and subhalo over here. It's a very massive one, more like 10 to the 9, but it's there. And uh, some people are putting a lot of hope on this thing, which is global VLBI, who can provide milli arc second resolution, these very nice Einstein arcs. And so having a very small, subhalo, very low mass subhalo would make a lot of perturbation to these arcs, and you could detect them. And then really go down this curve and distinguish between the models. The problem with the global VLBI is finding enough radio, radio arcs that you can still observe with the VLBI because it is very bright sources. If the SKA goes underway, we will find this very efficiently, as we saw yesterday. And the very final thing I'll talk about is um, that we, a few years ago, we realized there is something slightly wrong with our approach to substructure. And this means we need to go back to our original assumptions when we did started the lensing, which is that the space is empty everywhere apart from your lens. So what we were saying at the beginning was, here is a source, here is an observer, here is our lensing galaxy. Rays of light go like this. There is nothing happening here, nothing happening here. That is not true. And uh, it turns out there is actually, in simulations, you will find there is a lot of small subhalos along the line of sight. 
which means that the arrays will start, will have perturbations not only around the lens, but also everywhere along the line of sight. And so the big question for the last um, decade or so has been how important is this line of sight structure? And this really depends on the quality of your cosmological simulations. Can you model, you might have good enough mass resolution where your galaxies are, but what about the voids, the empty space between them? And this has been finally possible in the last few years after a lot of back and forth where people were saying it doesn't matter or it matters completely. Uh, so a work by Julia Despali recently showed that actually line of sight structure will dominate the signal. So if you take your, here is a plot of a, depending on the redshift of your lens in galaxy and the redshift of your source, this is the ratio of how many subhalos come from the actual galaxy and how many come from the line of sight. And you see if your um, lens is at a high, high redshift compared to the source, no. If your lens is very, and source are very close to you, there is not much path for the, for the light to go and it encounter many substructures along the line of sight. So you are completely dominated by the stuff in the lens. But very quickly on, what will dominate is line of sight substructure, which saved us a big headache. Because a big issue with this image where you have a have a lens with a lot of satellites around is that they are under the tidal influence of the central galaxy. So they'll be, as they orbit, they'll start losing mass. They'll be tidally stripped. This will change your mass function. Many of the small satellites will be destroyed completely. And we see that in real life. We see the stellar streams coming from uh, destroyed um, satellite galaxies. So this basically says most of your signal will be dominated by, by stuff along your line of sight, which is not under influence of massive galaxies. So the hopes are high. An ultimate killer will be once we go to the 30 meter class telescopes. Uh, with that, I'll move towards my conclusion. So at the very first day, I showed this image of the RxJ1131 is I think one of the most beautiful gravitational lenses. And I said that throughout this course, we will try to explain it. We will try to understand why it has four quasar images. We will try to understand where these images are with respect to the lens. We will talk about its extended Einstein ring and we indeed, we will talk about whether these uh, images vary in time and how they do. And we will talk about what influence does this small satellite galaxy might have on what we observe. In the uh, first two days, we spent a lot of time doing the lensing theory. But thanks to that, we were able to understand why we see four quasar images and how is the source located uh, compared to the caustics, which we uh, did in the exercises. Uh, in the day three, we saw the reconstruction of the extended source. We, I talked about different codes that can allow us to do this. And then today I talked about uh, that there is indeed some time, time variation between these images and how we can use it to understand cosmology. And just now I explained how small galaxies might tell us something about dark matter and how we can use strong lensing to understand them. So with that, I think I'll conclude the science part of this course. It has been a real pleasure uh, being here. Uh, you, you were an amazing class. I'm glad you kept on coming to, in such large numbers. I'm looking for our last um, session this afternoon. And if you allow me for a second, um, oops. I'll have two more kind of questions and then I will wrap up shortly. So these are not, there are no correct answers. I want to hear from you. We discussed multiple things. We did a lot of history and a lot of theory on the first two days. We talked about what we can learn uh, when we use strong lensing, lensing as a magnifying glass on day three. We, yesterday we talked about how we can find gravitational lenses and you are doing some exercises actually trying to find lenses. And today we talked how lensing relates to the cosmology. So which, one, which topic did you find most interesting or most engaging or most relevant for you? or just in which topic you learned the most.
good. Does it? Lensing a cosmology, wow. That actually works with the question I think I had on the first day, what are you guys interested in? And I think cosmology was the winner. And so if you more questions on this part, I spent some of my PhD doing this, so I am happy to, to talk to you afterwards. And the next question is the, on the afternoon part. So we did a number of exercises. I tried to mix them up. Uh, there were some equations that you had to derive on paper or on board. There was a practical exercise where we are redoing the groundbreaking paper from 1919, the first test of general relativity. Uh, we had to calculate the Markov lensing curve on day three, and I don't think we really discussed that. And I think right now you guys are working on lens finding using the class database. So these are very different type of exercises. What you might have in a normal, normal homework, some plotting and numerical calculations, and redoing two very different papers. Um, and I wonder what was uh, the best for you. Oh, wow, the, pap the papers are winning. I'm, I'm so happy. Because <laughs> when I was designing this course, I really tried to get you some feeling for how the actual work looks like. I don't want, I'm not a fan of theoretical exercises, and I guess no one is. <laughs> but they're good to understand what we are talking about. But it's the practical work that I think is more engaging, and you are actually redoing something that was done before as a, as a pretty groundbreaking papers. And so the final thing I wanted to say, this is a graphic I showed on the very first day. Uh, it's a painting of a gravitational lensing effect. You have a star over here. You have an Earth over here. You have a galaxy over here. This type of lensing never happens. We don't have stars that make multiple images of galaxies. But it's in Leiden. It's on the uh, wall of the Museum Boerhaave, the big natural sciences museum. And it's very nice to see it being up there. And what I wanted to say is, please do come and join us in Leiden if you want. And uh, so it's a beautiful city, very flat, unlike here, so you'll miss the mountains. Uh, you can cycle everywhere. The food is crap, but you can survive that. Uh, but, but we have opportunities for you. Uh, we are running a summer student research program. Every summer, we invite 20 to 30 students to work either at the Leiden Observatory or at the European Space Agency. We cover a wide range of topics where they want to build spacecraft to work on crazy theory. It runs every summer, early June to mid-August, 10 to 12 weeks of research. You don't have to pay anything for that. We pay for your flights, we pay for your visa, we get you accommodation, and we try to provide you with bikes sometimes. We give you a stipend to live off and maybe save some money as well. Um, the deadline will be in early February 2020. I'll send the link around. I think it's a great opportunity. Uh, we have re I'm, at least last year, we also had special funding allocated to people from South America. So that increases your chances of getting in. Hopefully, it will repeat in 2020 as well. Please, if you are interested to come join us, do apply. Um, along the same lines, but if you want to go somewhere closer and for a shorter time, Arun, who was here last year, tells me that Stanford now has, now has a special visitor program uh, for one to two weeks for students currently based outside of, um, a, um, outside of Europe and, U and uh, the US. So South America, Colombia is a perfect place to apply for this, and they would be really interested. The only problem is the deadline is like in two days. And, and uh, there is some proposal you have to write for it, so I'm sorry for this, but it will happen next year as well. This allows you to come to Stanford uh, for one or two weeks, I think on one or two occasions uh, in one year. And you get to work with the researchers over there. On more Latin propaganda, uh, we have a master student program. Oh, we know that guy. I know. <laughs> uh, we have leaflets for you, uh, so please, um, pick them up, or I will pass them around. Okay. Um, uh, the, it's a two-year program. You have to do two research projects in that. There are two application deadlines. Uh, first of April 2020 will be the next one. 
Uh, that means you would start in September, October 2020, and then 15 October 2020 for starting in early 2021. We put some effort into this. Come on. Uh oh. Okay, we made, we made YouTube videos uh, showing different people walking around Leiden and doing uh, weird things like cycling and um, <coughs> making coffee. And the final thing I would say is oh, it works. There's just a delay. It works <laughs> too many times. So I'll, before I launch 20 videos, I'll just continue uh, with this. Uh, we have PhD positions. Um, this is, again, a picture of the I took myself at 6 a.m. in the morning after a party. Uh, <laughs> the next deadline will be in autumn 2020. It's, again, four years, fully funded. Coming from outside the Europe doesn't mean you are at any disadvantage. We will help with the visa applications. Autumn 2020 is the usual deadline, but it's uh, useful to scan around because sometimes people have extra, have extra funding for some other starting dates. But um, application deadline will be next autumn 2020 for starting in 2021. Uh, I would put this year's application deadline, but the, it's tomorrow, so I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's it. It has been, again, my real pleasure being here. I'm looking forward to your exercises this afternoon. If you have any questions, please do ask. If you want to talk about applying in Leiden or in some other places, please talk to me. I might not be able to answer all your questions, but uh, I can get you in touch with the right people. If you have any questions about the course material, let me know. I'll upload the final slides uh, this afternoon. I'll also, after the weekend, provide solutions to full exercises. I'm still in town until Thursday, not necessarily in the department every day, but I'm responding to emails. I can come and talk to you. It's been a I was very happy here. Thank you. Um, the People send me slides on Google Drive. My Google Drive is open on the folder. Those of you, you who send that PDF, they are on top of my desktop, neatly next to each other in the center. And so the, we will hear today about the, uh, about the really interesting lens found, found in the Subaru uh, data, about the molecular clouds in the, clouds in the cosmic snake, uh, the detection of a low mass uh, substructure and how uh, convolutional neural networks can be applied uh, to, um, to lens modeling. And uh, I think we will wait one more minute and then we will start. Uh, so these are the groups. Uh, just to make clear, after each talk, we'll take a few minutes to reset. If you have any questions to the speaker, please ask. Um, don't make it too hard. And uh, final thing after the talks, we can stay here. You can continue working on the exercises. If you have any questions, please do ask. Uh, we will also try to finish the line searching exercises and see what kind of results are, are we getting. And with that, I think you can start slowly. Okay, so if uh, the first group of presenters would come forward. Okay, shall we start? So please, go ahead. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Geronimo Calderon. I analyzed and I studied with my fellow friends Brian Steve Pinilla and Mallory Agudelo. Uh, this paper, a spectroscopically confirmed double source plane lens system in the Hyper Supreme Cam Subaru strategic program. Uh, this was um, a paper by Tanaka et al. It was, it was like 20 people. <laughs> it was a big team, uh, mostly of Japanese investigators. And uh, I'm going to talk about and answer some questions about what was um, developed and researched and analyzed in, in this paper. So uh, the science question wasn't like explicit 
there, but we figured out that it was something like this, like how to confirm the nature of multiple sources seen through a gravitational lens using spectral characterization of its parts, of its components. Like uh, that was what we figured out was the science questions. We we're going to to go deeper into this topic right now. So uh, this is the system that was that was analyzed and discovered. Uh, the main image from which they took the, the lens was this one. It's easy to see that uh, this is uh, lens. Can you use this? This there is like a, a lensing galaxy right here, and we have a, a source that has been distorted. Right here, we have some images of of a, a, a special feature of the source that have been magnified. So it's clear that it is um, a gravitational lens. But also, uh, with more uh, like looking carefully, these investigators could determine that not there, this is not just one uh, source, the image of one source, but it's a double plane source. Uh, that's how they call it. Because we have two sources that have aligned correctly just to happen to be lensed uh, at the same time. Mm -hmm. So they determined that we have this blue structure out here with these features, with these light blue knots. And also they saw this little arc right here, which is magnified and it's clearer to see right here. This structure they call the source number one. It's like this little arc. They divided it in three parts. The, the main part of the source is like a, a segment of a ring. And this, uh, this feature right here, this section is the source one A west. And they call this one the source one A south. So it's the two components we have, we have right here. And uh, they have all these knots that are part of different features of the source that were magnified after passing through the lens. So uh, then we have like this little feature right here, this uh, H feature, which is like one of the parts where they measure redshift and they determine it's 1302. Uh, and this source which was measured right here is 1300. So they suppose that this feature right here and this uh, ring are like the images of the source number one. And they determine that all the other objects and the main ring that we see uh, on the outer part are part of the, of an, of the source number two, of S2. And they had like redshift of 1990 and 1988. So it, they said it was interesting. They found this little difference between the redshifts of one main part of the source. Uh, they said that even though there was that difference, they expected them to be physically um, entangled. They were like together. Uh, so yeah, that, that's it. And we have the main galaxy, the lens, which is at a redshift of 0 0.795 and they like the main name was this this is the catalog name which nobody can memorize but they called it the eye of Horus because it looks like the eye of Horus the, the Egyptian god so where is this this is the right ascension it's about 14 and a half hours and its declination is almost over the celestial equator and it that like makes it to the Virgo constellation so it's in like right in next to one of the arms of the Virgin but it's not very clear to see right there now uh, the, re the researchers observed this this uh, lens uh, with the Subaru telescope especially with the Supreme cam the hyper Supreme cam or HSC uh, so yeah like it's a huge camera <laughs> and they used it in the Subaru telescope which is 8.2 meters of diameter and these are like some photos of the instruments they, they, they used to take these images and then they uh, did some spectroscopy with this uh, with this instrument fire folded for the infrared echelet um, they worked on these uh, wavelengths in the micron regime, like one micron about, and 
this spectral resolution of 6,000. It was done in, yeah, in international time. It was in 15 to 16 of February 2016. And uh, the spectroscopy was made uh, through the Magellan Telescope in Chile. Okay, we have then this, uh, this work they did with spectroscopy. We can see the main peaks over here. Right in different bands for the different features they saw in the lens, and then we have here like the the main features also of the other source in different bands. Okay, that's what they used. They discovered it <coughs> serendipitously by a group of undergraduate students that were hosted in a in the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan in a science school. Uh, they were inspecting different galaxy cluster candidates and just found this by accident almost. They <coughs> used two different codes. I won't explain, explain it very widely because I don't have much time, but using the Glee code by Suyu and Halkola, uh, 2010, they modeled the galaxy lens, the two sources, and a little satellite galaxy, all this through SIE, SIS, like these models we have learned this week. I don't know much about, but that's what I could see in the paper. And they also use <coughs> The graphic code, which is by Oguri, 2010, which modeled uh, the main galaxy lens but as an elliptical one with a satellite lens of uh, SIS, of a singular isothermal sphere. And the, second, the, the first source was an SIE, an elliptical source. And the second one was the same as the, the last one, which was like they were moving the parameters so they could fit best all the data on all the observation. And this is the comparison between, this is the first code, the Glee one, this is the second one, the graphic one, so these are the two models or, or the expected ones by computer. And this is like uh, what you get when you subtract like the, some of the signal to the original image and you get like pretty close to what they expect. So yeah, thank you, that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's get ready for the convolutional networks. Okay, okay. First of all, uh, sorry because of the problem we had. Uh, we should be prepared uh, for this type of problem, but anyway, we get confident about the internet. Uh, okay, so we are going to suppose about how to uh, predict a uh, certain image contains a um, uh, gravitational lens uh, with the use of convol uh, convolutional networks. So. To begin with, I'm going to briefly introduce what is a convolutional network. Is a, So first of all, you have here your image, and you apply to the image a certain processes that help you to get a more informative representation of the data. This uh, operation that you do uh, normally are convolutions that are like uh, take like pieces yeah, in the image and apply a linear operation, operations with those pixels and also another operation that are pullings that take all those pixels and apply some type of function and get a better representation. When you have such representation, uh, we get what we call here the neurons. Yeah, so we get the input of the neurons and with certain input they activate or they don't activate and here we get in the final if this is activated or not for different, you got, uh, for different, for example, uh, predictions, for example, a truck, a car, or something like that. So the basic idea is to apply uh, this type of convolutional network uh, to these problems to reduce calculation that normally take weeks to seconds with approximately the same precision. That's why they say it's very faster. And also that is very convenient because it's easier to use by no experts and you uh, need less parameters uh, to say if in fact you have um, gravitational lens. Okay, so the outdoors uh, didn't use like that many real lenses. What they did was that they to several sets of images from the outdoors 
They Tors used several sets of images from several databases, including the Galaxy Zoo, the Operate 3 training data, and some simulated clumpy galaxies with Cersic and Gaussian DOM profiles. Then they used those images as the basis for some simulations where they created fake, like say, fake gravitational lenses. And they used this because normally it will take like a lot of time to gather all of the data for having some for having enough for, well, for having a data set big a data set big enough for training a convolutional neural network. So they generated a half a million images of gravitational lenses and they used those images for uh, for training the network. So uh, as for the observations uh, they employed some other tricks to better represent the phenomena. What they did was that they took, prior to training the, the neural networks, they used uh, random noise like Gaussian or short, short noise, uh, cosmic ray, ray mass, and PSF effects included at random during this process. This means that if you train the network twice, twice you, will, you won't get the same result. And this makes it, this, this all of this noise makes it very robust when trying to predict the parameters for image for real images which may have, may have noise or cosmic rays or all of the of this phenomena. Okay, so I'm gonna talk here about the lens that they uh, found correct. Yeah. Uh, as to do it, uh, I would like to agree that I try to search how many times they compute to train the neural network because I think that sometimes the solution is more expensive than uh, uh, the problem itself and I wasn't sure about how many times they explained that about, about yeah, uh, they quantify the accuracy of the predictions yeah, by taking uh, the dispersion of the data uh, from the real parameters. That is to say, for example, this red here and this green here are, for example, the real parameters. Yeah, and the predictions are other two. Yeah, and they took the ones that are within six uh, are the sixty-eight percent that are in the nearest from them. Yeah, and from those, yeah, they calculate the error that they have for the different parameters. Right? You know, the uh, I explain myself. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the the other thing that they do, the, they did this uh, to make it with the simulated data and get errors within the normal errors that the people normally obtain when apply another type of algorithms. Also, uh, they also make uh, predictions with very well confirmed. Uh, uh, they call it a uh, great A real uh, lenses. Yeah, uh, here is more information about why they call it in such a way. But uh, all of them were consistent with the algorithm, <laughs> basically because they are the these are the best that you can get. You get uh, the information from them without using very uh, powerful telescopes. Yeah. So okay. And also, another thing that they do um, is that they make principal component analysis. And basically, this consists in that you make a better representation for the image. Here, you see that if we take, for example, a base of pixels, yeah, each pixel will play to give a value. And we, with these numbers of representation of these number of bases, we get only this, but if we use a more convenient representation, we can get, for example, a zero here. It is an example, but they do the same for the real lenses. Yep. Okay. So then, in order to model the lenses, what they did was they used the network, but they used four networks. They used Inception version 4, Overfit, AlexNet, and a, ne a network of their own. And the main difference between these networks and their, and the version that they used was that they replaced the classification layer by a mean square error layer where they instead of doing classification they did regression. So this way they were able to train the network to do the regression for these five parameters which were 
uh, the singular isothermal ellipsoid for the profile, which were the Einstein radius, the two, the two components of complex electricity, and the coordinates of the center of the lens. Okay, so finally, but this is one of the new models of the 217. Uh, another, there is another other type of models that uh, use to fit maximum likelihood, uh, but uh, they take, for example, hundreds to thousands of other news and parameters in the models. Uh, here is a source if you want to consult because they need to describe, for example, the morphology of the ground sources. And also, uh, here, if you, if you want to consult the code or anything like that, if you, get, if you want to get involved, well, here is the code and the weights, and you can use it perhaps to try to predict some, you know, some very additional lenses. Yeah, that's all. Okay. Thank you very much. Any questions for the neural network stall? I have a question then. Yeah. How fast is it now with the neural network? Do they give some idea? Yeah, they do. They say that it's 0 0.1 second on a single GPU. So for, for a, a single lens on a single GPU. That's compared with the uh, maximum likelihood estimation, which is it takes weeks according to, to them. Because they also have to do some pre-processing to get the morphology features. And what the neural network does is that it gets all of these morphological features from the images uh, as a parameter inside of the processing with the convolutional components. Nice. So yeah, it's very, very efficient. And, uh, and they didn't only test on the simulated images, but they also tested it on real images from some available data sets, and they obtained good results. I, I think that it's fair to say that the same data lenses that they try on are from the best resolution that there is. So I, I don't know if the code works well for very complicated lenses yeah. that we saw today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Thank many thanks to all of you who did part in this. I think the presentation is very great. I was uh, really happy to see, I think all these speakers that are not in the papers, in the original papers, we really see went to look at other resources. Um, so thank you very much for the presentations. If you want to, we will stay here until 4 o'clock, working on the tutorials if you want to. Um, and that's it. Well done, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.